executive director of enterprise services here, which is one of the business units in ESB. And I will say as part of the enterprise services team, that includes the facilities team. So I would like to just give a special shout out and thank them for hosting the event here in our event space uh, this evening. So as chair of ESB's health and wellbeing sponsorship group, on behalf of ESB, I'm really delighted to welcome the workplace wellbeing community to our new head office here in Fitzwilliam 27. So this building was completed uh, in the second, just early in, the, uh, in 2022. We moved in in May 2022. And this building, I mean, you got a sense of it from the video, is a really sustainable building. And it's designed to really deliver an excellent people experience here in ESB, enabling smart, collaborative ways of working for everyone who works in our building. I know some of you will have had the opportunity to avail of the tour uh, before we started this evening's event, so I hope you enjoyed that. And for those of you who, had, who haven't had the opportunity for the tour, very briefly, our new workplace includes open plan neighbourhoods where teams can work collaboratively together, break areas including our fabulous uh, coffee shop on the fifth floor, which has an open top uh, area where people can go, which is really fabulous, especially during the summer months. And then we have meeting rooms that cater for both single and multiple occupancy. There's Wi-Fi throughout the building so people can work for virtually everywhere and stay connected to each other. We have natural light, natural ventilation, plants and break areas to really cre uh, create and maintain a healthy work environment for everybody. And that's maybe not to mention the beehives we have on our rooftop. In ESB, we really recognise the importance of health and well-being and how the work environment can, uh, can really help uh, one's well-being. And we have also extensive proactive well-being programs in place and really aimed at supporting everybody with themes that we focus on like physical uh, mental and financial well-being our health promotion manager brian sampson sitting up here in the front brian uh, at, is at this evening's event and i know you'll be hearing a bit more from brian uh, later but i'd really like to take this opportunity to thank brian for making this event happen in fitzwilliam 27. And um, maybe just a brief shout out to our guest speaker here, David, at the front row. It was a real pleasure now over the cup of tea to shoot the breeze with David about both of our running uh, exhibitions. But it'd be fair to say we were at totally different levels. So and of course, uh, we're also delighted to welcome and support uh, Brian Cook and this evening's uh, Workplace Wellbeing Community event here in the event space. I hope you really enjoy it. I know I'm really looking forward to myself and over to you, Brian. And thank you. Cool. Thanks so much, Geraldine. And thank you to, to yourself, Geraldine, to Brian, to Danielle, and to everyone at ESB for making us feel so welcome. I mean, lovely spread, fantastic offices, I think you'd agree. So thanks so much to everyone on the ESB team for welcoming us. So just to, to follow on what, uh, what Geraldine said, very briefly, I'll just talk a little bit about Workplace Wellbeing Ireland before we get into our conversation. Just in case you're not aware, it's a community. Uh, we bring people together, we share lessons learned, we talk about what's working and what's not in, in Irish workplaces. And it's just a little bit of motivation, a little bit of encouragement for others. And the kind of the aim really is to try and um, help us kind of create and sustain healthy workplaces all over Ireland. That's pretty much the goal. So we have events like today, we have, uh, there's podcasts, there's a weekly newsletter that goes out to almost 4,000 people every single Tuesday morning. And if you registered for this event, you'll get the newsletter next Tuesday. You're free to opt out, of course. Uh, but why well, would you do that? Um, and there's education and training then for anyone who wants to dive a little bit deeper. Back in 2018, when I first, we had our first event, and we brought people together for the first time, we came up with these values. And uh, I'm just delighted to say it's, it's a real, we kind of live and breathe these at, at the events. And it's, it's really about this kind of sharing without expecting anything in return. And we'll see, I mean, David's doing that tonight. ESB are kind of sharing their space with us tonight without expecting anything in return. It kind of, it just flows like that from everyone in the community. It's, it's a really lovely kind of space to be in. Um, we'll definitely have fun. It's an important, important topic, but we have fun and we respect everyone while we go about it. And we're well about making friends and not contacts. So hopefully you'll see you all again at the, at the next event in March. That's the community. Uh, we're going to have more events throughout 2023. Um, watch this space. You'll, you'll see updates on that. We'll probably be going again in March um, of this year. I, given the week that's in it, and I think whether you buy into it or not, I mean, it was Bloom Monday there on, uh, on Monday just gone. But I did want to give a shout out to a social enterprise that I'm involved with, Park Hit, the big, hairy, audacious goal of which is to promote the importance of resistance exercise. So there are free workouts. Uh, they're in six locations currently in Dublin parks. 
uh, you're welcome to check them out across the locations. I know David, of course, is involved with uh, Park Run. You might think of them as the resistance training equivalent of Park Run, and they're quite complementary. In two of our parks, uh, we, we, we go, um, Park Run takes place as well. We, we'd never clash. We, we go at 8.45, the Park Run takes place at 9.30. So there's quite a few, there's a few eager beavers out there that do the double header every now and then. So uh, you're welcome to, there's one of our locations, like lovely locations as well. That's the Park Hit Stony Batter, where we do it in uh, the, the grounds of the Law Society. So nice location, it's an experience rather than a workout. That's how we like to look at it. And there's a lovely logo there as well. Okay, so look, that's more than enough for me. I'd like, David, would you like to join me up here in these very comfy seats now? Make sure you don't fall asleep here. So intentionally now, I didn't, I didn't print out your CV. I'm going to see if I can remember because it's a pretty impressive CV. So we start with the athletics. For anyone who doesn't know, so David is a double European indoor gold medalist, 2005, 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Long time ago. A Beijing Olympian. Uh, made it to a world championship final in 2009. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, and you're, you're, you're retired 10 years this year. Mm. But what I think is probably most impressive, you're still the Irish indoor and outdoor 400 meter record holder 10 years later. Yeah, 10 years. Yeah, it's funny because it, someone actually mentioned that to me the other day. And I actually I had to get the fingers out and think, actually, it is 10 years. You're right. Yeah. No, it's um, look, athletics has been a huge part of my life. Um, I'm from Ballantyre in Dublin. I'm the youngest of four in my family, um, and we all did athletics. My two older brothers, um, my sister, and then me. Um, and I think it was more like a Tuesday or Thursday. Mum and dad just used to get us out of the house and go down to the local running club, which was literally at the end of our road. And I, I think, you know, when you mentioned, you know, Park Hit um, and Park Run and these kind of um, social initiatives of getting people together. I was very, very fortunate to grow up in an area where we simply had great volunteers. Um, we had uh, Liz and Eddie McDonough who were involved in Dundrum South Dublin Athletic Club. And last year, Liz retired from athletics after 49 years. You know, and when you talk about sharing and not wanting anything back, like, you know, she brought so many kids through uh, that running club um, and kids who went on and played at a high level of uh, across different sports. And, you know, I, I'm just blessed to have those opportunities on my doorstep. And look, when I started off, I never thought I would go on and have a career in athletics. It was just something that was fun. I enjoyed it. Um, I was competitive. I wanted to be the fastest in my class and stuff like that. So, you know, there was that element to it. But, you know, when I look back on the journey and, um, you know, getting the opportunity to travel the world. And, you know, I dreamt as a little kid watching Sonia O'Sullivan that maybe one day I would do a lap of honor. Um, and then lo and behold, it came true, you know, um, twice, which was fantastic. And when you have friends and family and all that stuff, and I know I shouldn't mention kind of drugs and athletics, but that was the drug, you know, I wanted to do that uh, again and again. And, um, you know, to represent my country in the Olympic games, um, even though it didn't go that well for me, um, you live, you learn, you debrief. And, you know, I came back the following year and as you mentioned, had a had a, a great world championships. And like, I, I'm forever grateful for athletics for opening the world to me, to travel in the world, to see uh, different places and, and those experiences. And, you know, 10 years ago when I retired was, it was a time when I thought I was ready to do so, you know, and look, we've been through an awful lot of change ourselves over the last number of years, going back to the recession, to the pandemic. You know, and, and, you know, when I retired, I thought I'll just move on. I'll just, you know, everyone was saying, you got the world at your feet. You can do this, you can do that. But the harsh reality of waking up on a, on a Monday morning in September and thinking, what am I going to do with the rest of my life was, was, was quite scary. If anything, you know, I, I was 30, um, you know, I, I used to go out with my mates around say Dublin when I was home and people would say, Oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm an athlete. And that was grand. You know, you could chat about that, but now the reality was I go out and they go, what do you do? And I'm thinking, I don't have an answer. <laughs> what do I do? Um, and that was, look, that was, um, a journey in itself. I'm trying to kind of figure things out, um, over the next couple of years. But, you know, when you mentioned 10 years, um, like I'm a, I'm a dad now with three kids, Oscar's nearly seven, Olivia's four and, and Louis two. And, um, myself, and my wife, like it's it, it's busy, you know. It's what is it? I don't have a watch on me, but it's probably um, she's probably in the zoo at home trying to feed the kids and get them to sit down while I'm here talking to you. This is very civilized. I like this. Um, but like the reality is, yeah, it's it's been ten years and it's gone quite fast. And you know, I'm probably still learning as as I go. You know, we we, we might touch on that uh, now or a little bit later. But yeah, the fact if 
you hear a few people like these days, don't you, that you're you're kind of tied to or your identity is tied to your job, if you like. And your job at the time was athletics. And so you felt when you retired 10 years ago that you'd lost your identity. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, very much so. Like I joined my local athletic club when I was seven. Um, I did other sports through my teenage years and I went to college here in Dublin. And then when I finished college in 2006, you know, I tasted success, as you said, in 2005. And I wanted more. I wanted to give it a go. So I wanted, I just really wanted to immerse myself in it and see what would happen. And I relocated over to Loughborough University in the UK. And, you know, I, I like people might know Simon Sinek and he talks about start with why and purpose. That was the promise to myself was, right, I want to be able to look in the mirror when I'm 30 and go, do you know what, David, you gave it a go. And that was the promise um, to me. So I did that. And athletics was absolutely everything to me. And I loved it. I loved being in a high performance environment. I loved being around like minded people. It was an ecosystem. I was feeding off these like medal winners every single day. And it really brought me to a new level. And then it was over. And that's when I kind of I didn't know who I was or I didn't know how people perceived me. You know, what were my skills? I, like I was good at running around an oval, but like, was that it? Because you're so ingrained in that and that's all that matters and i think even kind of outside of sport what i kind of realized that where was i getting all my confidence where was i getting my self-belief my self-worth it was coming from a training session it was coming from a performance it was coming from a, a medal or a championships and then suddenly that was all gone so you know that defined me but sport is very fragile you know you you've only got a shelf life i can't run forever i'm trying to run forever but not as fast as i once was but it, when it was all over, that was exactly it, like my identity. And I struggled with that because I think the reality of waking up and kind of you're 30 and some of my mates were like 10 years into careers and like, you know, they're looking to maybe look at new positions and roles and all this. And I'm kind of trying to figure out I'm on year zero, you know, and then the reality of life. OK, I want to get married. I want to start a family. I, w I want to buy a house. I've no money. You know, I've literally got no money. So then what drives my actions was, well, I need money. So then you get caught into this kind of pit of, well, what's success if I have more money, if I have a title? And that's what I craved. So panic ensued and I took the first job that came my way. Took the job, why? Because it paid well. I never actually asked myself, is this what I want to do? Or how does this contribute to the life I want to lead? It didn't matter. I wanted a title and I wanted money. And that drove me for the first year where I was spending an awful lot of time by myself, I was traveling the length and breadth of the country on behalf of, of like the company I was working for. Um, and I began spending an awful lot of time by myself. And again, people might relate to this, you know, working remotely, um, you're away from your direct team, you're, you're away from your colleagues, your friends, that social aspect to it. Um, and there was no like radio, Spotify, there was no colleagues. It was literally this guy inside my head and that internal dialogue just, but, became extremely negative and that drove my emotions and you know like I only spoke about this recently enough where like I described it as it's very easy to hide a mental health issue it's very easy to get up and just put on that mask and be the person that people expect you to be like I used to say I should be in Hollywood like winning Oscars for the performances I was putting on but that's the reality of it and then I'd come home you take the mask off and it was only the people closest to me like my wife Charlotte would see what was really going on and I think like when I think back to it, it I, I was I was struggling to find where I fit in this world. I was struggling to figure out, well, what was my my new purpose in life? You know, I was trying to replicate competing and running in front of 60, 70,000 people at an Olympic Games. You can't do that. Like, it's very, very hard. I'd say there's a lot of people maybe mid career now in, in a well, not not quite the athletics background, but a similar feeling similarly, like, you know, change your career, considering that if just, you know, losing their purpose, maybe for for their role. Mm. So how did you kind of rediscover that or what did you what was it that actually supported you at that time? Yeah, it, it took a bit of time. Like I, I packed in the job. I got a new job because I thought it was the job. Um, and then I soon kind of realized it's not the job. It's actually it's me. I, I, I need to maybe do a little bit of work on myself and. You know, I, I struggled and I've been open about this. I struggled with depression and anxiety. Um, I stopped exercising because I hated athletics. 
Why? Because it put me in the situation I was in now. So I resented that. Um, I began comfort eating. Um, I can tell you some epic stories about what I used to put away in in uh, in one meal. But that became the crutch, and that was just that vicious kind of circle. And it took a while to, I suppose, pluck up the courage to to actually get the help that I needed. Um, and again, being male, you're coming from sport. I I had I tasted success, if you like. So. I put an awful lot of pressure on me for the next phase of my life had to be um, up here. It had to be successful. And if it wasn't, well, then I was a failure. And that's how black and white it was in my in my mind. And also I was trying to fit in. I was trying to kind of figure out, you know, if I was successful in the world of sport, well, I had to be successful in somewhere else. Um, so the pressure was quite immense that I put on myself. And it was only probably maybe two years two years later after I retired that um and look you know I, I'll be honest with you it was when Charlotte was pregnant um on on Oscar um who was seven next month um heavily pregnant and I can I can remember just getting up one day it was a Sunday I hated Sundays because I dreaded Monday and the harsh reality of it and and look we're talking about mental health and there's all there's obviously that individual is trying to kind of deal with a mental health issue but there's also that person beside that 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 individual you know be it husband wife partner girlfriend boyfriend whatever um who are trying to support that person but in where i was i kept pushing them away because i didn't know how to articulate it. i was afraid of what people would maybe think of me or I, I you know i'd be labeled weak you know you come from sport as faster fitter stronger all that stuff but i can remember that sunday where um like Charlotte tried to kind of, oh, you need to do something, you need to do that. And I would just like, you know, the red mist would descend and I'd have a tantrum essentially. Um, but that was the day I actually did realize, God, how, how am I going to bring a child into this world if I'm not right? So again, you're kind of looking at the priorities, what's important now. And I'll, I'll make like no excuses. I put myself as P1 for years. Like it was my career. That was it. That's exactly what's going to happen. I was priority number one. And I suppose the realization of my career been over as an athlete that, you know, I had to reevaluate. I had to readjust. I had to figure out, well, what was now important to me? Um, and I got a great piece of advice was someone said to me, hey, David, how much do you need? And I was like, what, what, what do you mean? He goes, how much do you need? How much money do you need to live? And I was like, as much as I can get. And then he said, no, no, like, you know, how much do you need? And that's when I began to kind of reevaluate and go, well, if I want to live a certain life, if I want to have time with the kids, if I want to do the things that I love doing, you know, if I want to live in a house or a big house, small house, if I want to drive all these things, well, then well, how much do I need? And that was a great kind of ground and um, moment moment for me to kind of realize and go, well, you know, OK, this is what I need. And look, I got professional help and I still do. Uh, I'm not afraid to to tell everyone that I was with my counselor yesterday. Um, in 2016, I went every single week. Uh, now I go every second week and I go to the gym, I run, that's all physical. I go to a psychologist, that's the mental aspect. And I think they're very much intertwined. And, you know, I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't been open and honest with everyone, because if you look at the stats and the research around mental health, I can guarantee there's at least one person in this room or someone close to someone in this room that's struggling with their mental health. And that's the reality. And if we don't talk about this, we're never going to remove the stigma. We're never going to help ourselves or help anyone else. And if we all want to work in a culture where we can trust and we can confide and we can be open and honest, well, then this is what we need to do. Um, and, you know, going back to your original question, it was a combination of people. I realized, you know, what, I need to take a bit of time out. I need to reevaluate. I need to find who I am now. I need to say goodbye to the David who was an athlete um, and accept that that's over. Um, and that's that's a good way. I went back and I did a qualification in psychology and um, the lecturer one day put up uh, this model called the Kubler-Ross model. And the Kubler-Ross model originated as a grief cycle. Um, and what I found was actually, you know, it resonated because I was at a point where I was grieving. I was grieving about the loss of my career um, and I was struggling to adapt into a new career. And, and, and adapt with change. Now, the Kubler-Ross model is now the transition curves, the change curve, you know, it's evolved. But, you know, I was at a state where I could see the big dip of depression and low mood and all that. But that that was at the point where you accept. And that was a key thing for me. So I think for people who are going through change or maybe thinking about that is, you know, sometimes you have to look beyond the um, the career element to it. It's like, well, how is this going to impact my whole entire life? Um, and I know that might sound quite broad, but like I look at careers and I look at work as like 
an endurance sport. You know, I was a sprinter. My event was over in less than 45 seconds. I'm now trying to be a marathon runner, which isn't really going that well, but it's the endurance. And I think sometimes you look at it from, okay, well, what's this going to look like? How does this going to impact me? And what are the things that I need to do to enable me to have that success in that space? And um, I think talking, I think being open and honest with the people around you. Um, I, I was very fortunate in my career to have some great people around me from a coach to training partners, but also people who helped me, sponsors, people who has made their way in, in business and were now kind of giving back. And when I retired, I thought these people were now useless to me. You know, there was no money in it any, anymore. They're useless to me. And about a couple of years later, I realized these are the people that I now need to talk to. And it's like having your own kind of like um, board of management. These are the people that I go and I have mentors now, people who are, again, successful um, and they're only too willing to kind of meet for a coffee and, and, and have a conversation. And that's been really, really important to me in terms of my next kind of chapter in life or my next career, because they'll see things in me that I won't see. And it's an opportunity for me to bounce things off. They'll hold me to account. They'll ask me, you know, to go away and have a think and come back and, you know, they'll challenge me on that. And I think that's vitally, vitally important. And that's something I had as an athlete and it made me um, a better athlete. And I think it's very important to have those people in our, in, in our lives. It might be a friend, it might be a family member. It, it could be someone in business that you aspire to or you trust or, you, you know, someone that you can just have an open conversation with. And I think that's very, very important. When it does come to change and maybe you're thinking about these things, you know, talk to people that you trust and value their opinion. But very well said. And thanks for sharing all of that. You mentioned conversations there quite a few times and having people around you. I have heard you speak before about and let's say maybe to the people in the room who who might who might be struggling or it's that first conversation is probably the hardest one would you agree and maybe t tell us about that first conversation if yeah. you wouldn't mind well it was actually it was on that sunday um and i mentioned charlotte kind of said oh you know you, david you need to go and talk to someone and then the red mist was saying you go no you don't know what you're talking about and then like you know when you see the person that you love just kind of break down in tears and you realize what am i doing um i was at a I, I was at a talk. It was actually first fortnight. I know people might be familiar with first, for, first fortnight. Yeah, they run various things in the first two weeks of the year. And then um, Richie Sadler, who people might know, he's the football pundit uh, on RTE. So Richie was two years ahead of me in school. Um, he's from Ballantyre and he lives around the corner from me now. And I can remember he, he was talking about his career. So for those of you that don't know, Richie was a footballer over in England and he had a bad, um, I think it was a hip injury. And he had to retire from football at like 23, 24. Um, and obviously went through his own kind of journey of dealing with that. And I can remember him talking about this. And I was just sitting in the in the audience like you are here today. And I remember thinking, she's talking about me. That's me. And um, I knew Richie personally. And uh, on that particular Sunday, I was like, I need, I need help. You know, I need, I need to talk to someone. So I rang Richie and he said, uh, yeah, sure, look, come on down for a cup of tea. And I can remember him like, vividly when he said, come on down for a cup of tea, I thought, lads don't go for cups of tea. This is just, I don't do this. This is awkward. So I called down to his house anyway. And um, he, uh, at the time, he was just living across from Marley Park. And he said, you know what? Forget the cup of tea. We'll go for a walk around the park. And I was just like, yeah, Grant, whatever. Um, and we went for a walk around the park. And it was brilliant. Um, and there's a great charity out there called Men's Shed. And their slogan is uh, Men Talk Shoulder to Shoulder. And straight away, and for those of you that know Richie, um, my wife thinks he's gorgeous anyway. So I didn't have to look at him. I was shoulder to shoulder. Um, and we just spoke and he said to me, you know, how are you getting on? And I said, to be honest, it's not good. And um, we just had a conversation about it and he just listened. And then he told me about his journey. And I can remember thinking, geez, you know, what? I'm not the only one. And that was the biggest thing because for so long I thought, I'm the only one who's like, nobody can understand, you know, my journey and how I'm feeling. So I won't talk about it because I, I felt very difficult to articulate and I didn't know how to. And then when Richie kind of said it to me, I was like, Jesus, like, you know, he gets it. And then um, I was like, well, well, like, what did you do? Who did you go and talk to? Or, or how did you go to the next kind of step? And he was like, well, you know, I'll give you one piece of advice. Don't stop at the first hurdle. So he said when he started going to counseling, he went to about like two or three before he actually connected with someone. And I think that's really, really important because sometimes you think, right, I'm going to go to a counselor, but like, we're all human. You know, when you go into a room, I might not connect with you. I might may not feel at ease in your presence. So again, that your environment is really, really important. And it took me about uh, five from counselors to 
psychotherapist to whatever uh, until I connected with someone. Um, and that was that's really, really important. And I think, again, when we talk about supporting people, you know, who might be going through a mental health issue, it's that environment is very, very important. Um, be it outdoors or, you know, creating somewhere where they feel um, comfortable and even maybe been a little bit direct with them. And, you know, you could say, I know you haven't been yourself lately. Um, is everything OK? They might say nothing to you, but, you know, you build up that trust um over time and maybe it's going for a walk and things like that and i think for me that really kind of worked and um and even just listening i think sometimes when we have someone who's close to us or someone that we know like it's in our nature to help them we want to help them and we jump in you need to do this you need to do that but that could be the wrong thing to do at that time um and i know for me like my friends and family when they'd come and go you need to do this particularly my mom like it was like been about eight and she'd come in and be like you know you need to talk to someone it was like you know, when you're eight and you like, you've been told to go up and clean your bedroom. It's like, you know, that rage comes in, I'll clean my bedroom. And um, so you'd push these people away. But I kind of learned all, all I really wanted was someone to listen. Don't judge me. Don't tell me what to do. Just listen. And then over time, you know, when you have that kind of rapport with people, and you build up that level of trust. It's a case of, OK, well, actually, did you ever think about going this direction or talk to that person? And that really helped. So, you know, for me, it was that Sunday, that conversation um, and almost just kicking the ego to touch and just going, you know, I'm not in a great place. I'm not good. Um, but hearing someone's journey who came out the other side was very, very positive. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, I think that was very, like, just hugely beneficial to where I was at the time. Brilliant. Yeah. And I really like the idea of the, let's say, shoulder to shoulder, if you, ha you need to have a, a, a challenging conversation. For, for someone who is maybe struggling with something, if you're looking someone in the eye, you can almost feel like the eyes are burning. Yeah. Um, so see change, I know, talk a lot about that. You might you might think like some of the most important conversations you've ever had have been while you're out for a walk with someone or maybe in the car with someone. You're not actually looking at them uh, eye to eye, it's shoulder to shoulder. Um, and I see I see Adrian is here for Mental Health First Aid. They would talk about that as well. So um, yeah, some really, really great advice. Thanks for sharing uh, that part of your story. Um, you're clearly like we only touched on a quarter of the CV, really. Like you, you had a challenging start to the, let's say, the work life after athletics. But since then, I mean, you, you have gone on to achieve a lot, a uh, very busy schedule, lots of partnerships. Uh, you didn't just take part in Celebrity MasterChef, you won it. You didn't just take part in Hell Week, yeah. you stayed to the end. Is that, does the competitiveness come from athletics or is, where, where's gonna, that come from? Are you going to ask me am I doing uh, Dance with the Stars next? I, I, I know, I don't even have to ask you. I know you must have turned that down. I, uh, I, I actually, would you believe, I did turn it down the first year because I thought, um, I kind of thought I was going to be an Irish version of like Strictly Come Dancing, probably in a barn somewhere down in, in, in rural Ireland. I said, no, I won't do it. But um, yeah, no, it, like it, it, it's funny, like MasterChef was nearly 10 years ago. And like I, ne I never kind of woke up one day and go, oh, I want to be a reality TV star. Like, you know, I'm not really into the celebrity aspect of all that. But I, I was injured um, when I was in Australia. I tore my Achilles. And again, it was like it was at the point where I had just turned 30. And I kind of knew in my heart that my days were numbered. Like I, I wasn't making any money from the sport. I was beginning to really think about what I'm going to do next. I got asked to do Celebrity MasterChef, came back and. Um, it was brilliant. And again, I never expected to, to win. Like my mom was like, how did you win that? Um, but I loved it. And I think for me, sometimes I, I can just throw myself into it. And maybe it's kind of the athletics where, you know, we, we, we work off, um, you know, so say every year you get literally four weeks off. OK, so it's 11 months in, in, in the athletic year, if you like. And it's always working towards a championship which is at the end of that year. So you could be training for, you know, almost eight months before you do your first race. And out of that whole year, you might be looking at somewhere around about 10 races. So on average, 45 seconds, that's 457, oh, just over seven and a half minutes or something out of the whole year. That's all you want. So the way you would operate in that kind of world is you work, you periodize your year. So you work off four week blocks. So three weeks intense, really hard training, one week easy and go again. And I think that makes you kind of quite, methodical in your process where you're focusing on you know the here and now you stay present and you work on today tomorrow and you forget about what's coming down the line and i think with masterchef that was kind of the process it was the task in hand 
um, forget about what's going to happen at the end of the week or in, in, in three weeks as it was in, in, in that case. It was just focused on the tasks you were given. Likewise in Hell Week, which I don't know if people watch Hell Week. It is on the player if you want to catch up. Um, I actually tried to get it last night. Season two isn't up for whatever reason, but must be some blip. That's a blip. We'll it's got to it. be there. Go digging. Um, the hardest thing I've ever done, but one of the, the best weeks of my life, one of the most rewarding weeks of my life. Um, why did I do it? As people kept asking me, why are you doing Hell Week? You know, and, and look, there's easier ways of getting your, your face on TV than doing Hell Week. But I wanted to challenge myself. Like, again, we did it for charity. Um, I did it for, for the Coombe Hospital, Friends of the Coombe. Um, and the, the sole reason was I, I just wanted that challenge. I wanted to see if I could put myself back in an environment where I'm going to be challenged, like challenged mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, I wanted to see if I still had it, you know, from the world of athletics, when you're really like scraping the barrel, trying to get a performance and pick yourself up and go again, that resilience. I just want, I wanted to like answer that question myself. And um, yeah, it, again, the whole process just focused on the here and now. And like, like, how do you describe Hell Week? And this is probably something I'm still trying to download because so much happens and you've been challenged on, on every kind of level. Um, less than seven hours sleep in a week, like calorie wise, you're probably down around 1200 calories in a day. And, you know, you've been tasked like to walk up a mountain with 25 kg in your back. Like, just so much goes on, but probably one of the most hardest and difficult tasks were where we, um, and I don't know if people actually saw this, but we had to do a self evaluation, um, of yourself, obviously. And then you had to evaluate everybody else in the room. And then it was given straight back to you. And like, it was just an eye opener. Because like even for myself, I learned more in that like hour of trying to answer these questions about myself um, and evaluate where I was at. We had to we had to write out like we had to write out basically what made us ourselves. And and, and like the DS Ray Goggins was like, and don't give me like the medals you've won and the performances. Who are you? You know, and you're like, you're like, Jesus, how do I answer this question? Like, you know, and but it was brilliant because you completely start evaluating and, and questioning yourself and you're emotionally drained, you're hungry, you're cranky, you know, and all these things you're writing down and then you have to evaluate everybody else. And like what really struck me was like about your own self-awareness, you know, how many times you actually get that feedback. We don't do that. And some people's self-awareness was spot on. Some people's was way off, you know, um, and it was just a real kind of eye opener. And I think those kind of moments, you know, when you throw yourself out of your comfort zone, your complete comfort zone, you learn, you grow. Um, and like I came back from from Hell Week and um, Charlotte opened the door of the house and she was like, where are you? I'd lost so much weight. I was cranky for the, I couldn't sleep, um, even though I was so tired. And when I slept, I you know, we had to change the bed sheets for the first like week because I was sweating so much proper, like post uh, traumatic stress. Um, I was barking at the kids all the stuff that you don't see on the TV, but you know, a lot of lessons learned and you know, maybe that's it. Maybe the, the fact that I got to the end of that week was, um, probably because maybe I went through kind of mental health issues and I wasn't afraid to ask for help and advice. And, um, I learned an awful lot of through that journey. And I think I'm more resilient now than I ever was. And probably the greatest strength isn't how fast I can run. It's probably that I was, I put my hand up and asked that vulnerability. I, I asked for help and advice. And, uh, yeah, like it's, it's kind of funny when we start talking about this and you kind of go back, God, it is 10 years. And then you look at everything that's gone on in that decade. And, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's been a hell of a journey, but it's been up and downs as well. But uh, I think having that core kind of base of what's important to me, I think, you know, you talked about values there as well. And I think our own kind of personal values and what matters to us and is very important. And even practical things like I to get better at um I kind of, my motto for 2023 is, uh, um, it's a quick no and a slow yes, you know, whereas before I was probably, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. And then, and then you know, you're, you kind of fill up the diary and um, I work for myself and it's it's hard. It's hard at the, the start of a year as well, because you're always a bit freaked out about financials and what way is this going to go and do we have enough work and how we pay the bills and all that. But I've probably learned to understand the peaks and troughs. Um, and adapt to that and now with a family as well like you know the quiet times make the most of those um, and be present with people as well I think when I first started working for myself I, I I was maybe physically present but mentally I wasn't there 
you know, you're on the phone, you're thinking about this, you're thinking about that. And, you know, you end up kind of maybe overcooking it in the evening times. And then at the weekend, well, I'll catch up, I'll do more stuff. And I wasn't resting. So like, I know not everyone might be able to, may not be able to do this, but when Oscar was, was born, um, I decided that I wasn't going to work Mondays because I, I'd work weekends. I did an awful lot of park run stuff and I'd work weekends. And um, I remember my, um, I always felt guilty about saying no, because I was always fearful that I was losing opportunities. Um, and then I, he was like, well, why don't you uh, not work a day? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, just don't work a day. And I was like, oh, I can't do that. Um, and he described like he works evenings and he works uh, weekends and stuff. So where do you kind of have your time? And, and um, I, I took the, I didn't work on a Monday when Oscar, the first year Oscar was born and it was, it was brilliant. Like Charlotte went back to work afterwards and then I was around to help him. And, you know, I look back at that and it was brilliant. You know, I'd bring him swimming on a Monday and I kind of got over that guilt. I almost was felt, I'd come out of the house and I'd look around and go, there's no neighbours right into the car and gone. Because I was fearful of like, <laughs> you know, how would it be judged or something? She runs a dosser, he does nothing. Um, but, I, you know, again, it comes back to you as an individual. And I'm not saying that like, you know, I'm fortunate that I was able to do that. But at the same time, it's getting the values correct. It's getting the priorities correct and what matters to you. And, you know, maybe in the pandemic, people had an opportunity to kind of, you know, reevaluate and spend more time with people, um, the people that mattered most to them. And it's kind of those learnings and taking something from that that you can you can kind of cherish, but also keep it a cornerstone of your being and what makes kind of you you and how you structure your day and your week. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. Well, I love the advice or the your motto for the year, a quick no and a slow yes. That's definitely something I'm going to uh, you got take on yet. board. Yeah, you did. Thank you. I pre- we appreciate it. Everybody here got a yes, so we really appreciate that. Kind of, kind of touching on what you're talking about there, maybe because it was Blue Monday there. Oh, and by the way, if anyone has a question, maybe have a think about a question. We'll, we'll come to some questions now in a moment. Um, Blue Monday, if you believe in that kind of thing this week. Um, but you, So you were a professional athlete there for a long period of time. You, you said when you when you first stopped, you, you stopped exercising. Yeah. Uh. But you're 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 back now. You're involved park runs, uh, cycling is a, is a big thing in your life. The marathon, of course. How did you kind of rediscover? I think purpose is really important when it comes to exercise. You need a purpose, and you obviously you clearly had a purpose when you were an athlete. The times and the qualifications and all of that. How did you rediscover that purpose? Or where does your purpose come from now? Given that you're not was competing if you like yeah yeah um no it's a good question and, and again you kind of reference the third week of january you know blue monday and you know people talk about habits and routines and maybe this is the week that things fall apart but again it's very individual to different people but i i, I think for me like initially yes i hated sport like and i don't know if people have read uh open andre agassi's book where he talks about it's a great book but he talks about he hated tennis um, and I was very, very, the very same. I, I resented it, you know, and the reality was that tennis I, now or athletics, <laughs> both, um, no athletics, but it was very much, I, I didn't have, I didn't say goodbye to the sport on my terms. I didn't have an exit plan because I thought I was going to compete in Beijing, go on to London, go to Rio and then retire. I made one Olympics, you know, and I, I didn't get the opportunity to say goodbye to the sport on my terms. I, I finished injured um, and that was tough. So then I kind of went through that journey. I hated the sport and, you know, I resented it because I go onto social media and I start looking at other sports people and seeing, okay, they're doing this and they're doing that at post sport. And I was thinking, well, why am I doing that? You know, I, I, I go, why am I? And I berate myself then for not seizing the moment and opportunities and I should be doing this and should be doing that. So that kind of whole comparison to other people. Um, and I, I like we're talking about park run. My first park run um, was in uh, 2016, and it was when I went to back or I went to counselling. And the parallels are there. Like when I began talking and kind of understanding why I was feeling certain ways, and then kind of what what was I not doing now? I wasn't exercising. I wasn't running. I wasn't doing the thing that I'd done since I was a, a young kid, which was a huge part of me. I just like pushed it away again. Maybe that was the drug. You know, I enjoyed it, but I, w- I was fearful of going back there. I was fearful of getting re-injured and kind of, you know, picking that scab, um, or that open wound all over again. And the reality was I, I kind of knew I need I need to do something. I need to get out. And I, I can remember I was uh, we were renting um, up in Knock Line at the time. And I can remember, right, I'm going to go for a run. And I left the house and I got probably 
I don't know, maybe six minutes into the run and I just stopped and I was just like, I hate this. And I remember walking home and um, I was like, I questioned myself, like, you know, how have I got to this point? Like, I used to love this. Um, and then through counseling, I began to understand and began to kind of make sense of things. And then it was like, right, I'm going to go up and do the park run. And um, it would get to like a Wednesday, I'm doing a Thursday, I'm doing a Friday. Nah, no way. And it was pure ego. I was afraid of going up. I was afraid of like, sounds ridiculous, but afraid of being recognized and, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, eventually one Saturday, like a non-negotiable, get your arse up there. And I went up and I've told this story before, but I walked into the field. It used to start in front of the house in Marley Park, if people know the concert field. And I remember someone, and I grew up around Marley Park. My running club is originated there. And I remember walking in and a fella came up to me and he was like, Gillick, you should win this. And it wasn't even a hello. And I remember thinking, I thought Park Run's a bit of fun. And then like, it was all welcome local Olympian and all this. And it's just not what I wanted. Um, but I took off and, you know, just legged it like in um, 1K, 2K, 2K, I was dying to death. And then I'm not making this up. A fella passed me pushing a buggy. Um, he looked at me. I looked at him. I knew what he was thinking. And like I finished it and it was it was early morning on Saturday. And I was like, geez, I actually feel good. And and that was it. That was kind of, and at this point, I, I had packed in my second job. I was kind of trying to figure out what I was going to do. And that became my go-to. And I'd go up on a Saturday and I'd do the park run. And then, you know, I'd try and kind of, want to better myself and then I began kind of you know I'll eat a little bit better or rest a little bit better and um that kind of got me back into the into into running and exercising and I felt good and after a couple of months I then went to um to the track down in Tala because I knew the coach and there was a couple of young athletes jumped in with them on a Tuesday Thursday park run Saturday I had structure and that really helped I had a bit of a routine um, and I enjoyed it and I wasn't bringing the watch. I just ran. I just ran for feel and, you know, no music or nothing. I just ran and I really enjoyed that. And then eventually, actually, this was 2016, I, I raced. And it's probably the best thing I've ever done because uh, I suppose in reality, I, I needed to go back to go forward. I needed to say goodbye to the sport. I needed to do one more race. You know, and sometimes it might be like having that difficult conversation, you know, to move on or whatever that might be. And that was me to try and uh, and run a race again. And I hadn't raced in four years. Um, and I remember pleading with this uh, meat promoter, an Italian lady, to get into this tiny little meat in Pavia in Italy. And I gave her the big, I'm David, I ran this and blah, blah, blah. And her response was, I'm sorry, we don't have any space in any race. And then I went back to her and I was like, oh, I have a few injuries. Now, now the sob story, you know. Um, and she came back and, and again, I'm not making this up and I'm not looking for laughs. This is exactly what she said. Uh, did you win Celebrity Master Chef Ireland? And I was like, yeah. And she said, no problem. On you come. So got myself into a race in Italy, and um, I was in the B race, and I came last. I ran 48 seconds. The time I ran, probably when I was like 16 in secondary school, but it was the best race I've ever ran, and it w it was very difficult. I was extremely nervous. I was so afraid of what might happen at 200 or 250 meters. Would I get injured? Would that kind of that domino effect of kind of you know ripping that wound open again and having to go back through all of that because I didn't trust my body. I literally didn't trust my body. Um, and I finished that race and didn't care. There was no money. There was no medals. There was nothing. I, I didn't, it was all just about, I needed to do that. And, and that got me back into sport. And, and then most recently kind of, yeah, like you know, people always go, oh, you must be highly motivated. You know, I'm not, I did it when it was my job because it paid the bills and I had to, but like, no, I, I, I'm probably not the most motivated person to go for a run or do anything like that. And I was probably flipping and flopping over the last couple of years, doing a bit of cycling and cyclocross and things that I enjoyed and going out with my mates and all that sort of stuff. But then last year, I was like, you know, I need to put a bit of structure on this. And that's me. I love structure. I love routine. Um, I feel good when I go out and I do something and I feel good if I have a target and I aim for. And I did the, the, the Dublin Marathon last year. Um, started training in January and uh, I absolutely loved it and um, gave me a huge sense of purpose, you know, running around your home city, like it, it, the atmosphere was just unbelievable. And um, yeah, it was pretty ugly the last 10K, but I got there and um, that was it. And, and, and that's something now that I've kind of realized like is very, very important to me. I need to have a little kind of personal goal. I need to have things that I'm aiming for because 
it keeps me accountable. And look, I know a lot about running, but you know, for this circumstances and then again, going back to people in their careers, we, we need other people. You know, we don't have all the answers and I, I got a coach, someone to hold me to account. So again, going back to the, your own kind of board of directors or board of management, having people that can, that can challenge you and, and, and sport for me was no different. And, um, yeah, I've signed up for this year as well. So I have, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, I mean, our theme today is to power your people. I mean, that's clearly how you're powering yourself in, from, you know, from an exercise point, of, exercise point of view. And I think that's really important and great advice. Talking about having, you know, a personal goal. I'm, I'm the same in terms of need, just needing a bit of structure, a bit of routine around an exercise habit, whatever it is. And, you know, I'm not running marathons. I'm not lifting heavy weights, but I'm just very consistent yeah. across the board. And it's, it's that's and like my daughter will always say if, if I don't get, if I miss my whatever it is, uh, a couple a couple of days in a row, uh, like I'm I'm a cranky pants. Yeah, there's no yeah. question. I kind of need that structure, that routine. It is, you know, you're right. But I also kind of think as well, like you got to keep it in check. Like we, you have to be kind to yourself as well. And you know, this whole thing of like, oh, you know, my New Year's resolution is is gone or I failed. You haven't failed. You just pick yourself up and you go again. And I think sometimes where, you know, and even now you look at social media, it's all about, yeah, let's attack the year and do that. And that can be very off-putting for people. And even this whole pressure of like, well, you know, everyone's talking about New Year's resolutions. Do I have one? It, you don't have to have one. It can be a case of going, do you know what? I might go for a walk this weekend, you know, and that could be the start. And if you don't get out for a walk, well, you know what, do it next week or something, you know? And I think we're all very, I'm like you though. I, I'm like, like Charlotte be kicking me out of the house if I haven't gone and exercise in a couple of days. But again, we're all different, but I think it's, you know, keeping things in balance as well and you also kind of said there about empowerment like i think that's hugely important and again you know trying to motivate our people and you know help our people empowerment is huge uh, and again it's it's very much kind of you know your self empowerment and your locus of control and you know having your own goals and realizing your strengths and your weaknesses and not being afraid to ask for help and advice because even that phone call even that conversation could give you huge empowerment um and make you feel good and if you feel good chances are you'll probably make other people feel good as well. And I think that's very important. Big time, yeah. And and talking about powering your people, it's all about leading by example, isn't it? And I mean, you're definitely doing that today, talking about your, your own mental health challenges, the exercise side of things as well, and how they fit together. So yeah, I mean, thanks so much for sharing all that. And do we have any questions for David? I think we have a few microphones here. And just while we're handing them out, maybe we might talk to, I mean, David spoke kind of very kind of openly there about the kind of the, the career change that was almost forced upon him. But I think we've got a great example here, uh, Brian Sampson. Brian, if you want to say a few words, Brian, I think your background was IT, if I'm not mistaken. And I think are you are you three years now, you're the head of health and well-being for ESB. I mean, I love hearing these kind of career change stories. Yeah, that's Brian. Something similar to yourself. I'm a recovering IT project manager. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so I was in IT since I left school, really, um, up till 2019. So I joined ESB in 2016 as a, an IT project manager. But uh, health and well-being and similar to yourself and David, like that passion for sport and health and well-being has just always been there, something that's come natural to me. So for years, I've been kind of taking study certifications outside of work and then uh, very lucky in 2019, a position came about in ESB as a health promotion manager, a brand new position, and I interviewed and, and got it and been in it, in it ever since. Fantastic, yeah, and tell us a little bit about the team here. It's a, it's a decent sized team, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah. ESB health and wellbeing there, team. There are a few of them here now. They put their hands up, one behind me here, Danielle, Fiona, and Laura, and Morgan up the top there. Uh, keeping an eye on everybody. Um, so yeah, so the health promotion team, there are eight of us in total. Um, so we have a mix of health promotion officers, which is what Dan, Danielle, she's the newest member into the team. And then we have some EAP officers as well who do a lot of kind of health promotion project management to work as well. So their role is split between kind of providing a confidential support to staff all over the country so they can directly, the staff can directly access them, but also implementing kind of health promotion and health and wellbeing programs. So we're about to launch, which Laura is working on, which is a menopause workplace support program, which we hope to have rolled out to the company in March. And then Danielle here beside me is working on a program to to kind of educate staff around the important, uh, the importance of exercise and movement. So that's been pieced together at the moment and we place a huge emphasis around supporting staff's mental health. 
Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I love the kind of career change story. And I also love the, you know, all these new roles that are being created, health and well-being across organizations in Ireland and ESP certainly leading, leading by example there. You've got a significant uh, well-being champion network, if I'm not mistaken, as well. I mean, ESP is all over the country. You have uh, champions all over the country. We have. We've 90. We've 90 champions. We have two in Bahrain, ESP in Bahrain. We've about five in the UK, two up in Northern Ireland, and then we've about 80 then here in the Republic of Ireland in total. So we have a, uh, a program at them. We meet up in every quarter. We give them updates. We let them know what's going on. And then we have a, a monthly comms plan with them as well. So we provide them with uh, a monthly bulletin, uh, a monthly calendar. And we've just kind of broadened that out this year as well. So we pro provide it with an actual calendar. So every day there's a well-being reminder so they can work with the staff that they support in their location or in the teams as well. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Any questions for David? Any questions for Brian? Adrian. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Adrian Yates from Mental Health First Aid Ireland. Uh, David, I just want to say thanks uh, for your courage for sharing with us today. Uh, you'd be delighted to know I don't have a question for you, just really a comment more than anything else. I found it really refreshing to see the two of you sitting there talking about health, mental health in such a relaxed way, such a normal way. And you mentioned stigma. And stigma really is the biggest barrier for people to get help with their uh, with the, with any problems they might have. So I think it's really brave of you to come and share those stories because what we see is if we look on YouTube or whatever, it'll be our gold medals and it'll be all the you know the bling stuff. And to think that there's a backstory there that is so inspiring. I think it was really really powerful to hear what you had to say. And you know, the best way we could fight stigma is when we all approach it in that way. We're all human, we have ups and downs, but when we're afraid of something or afraid of how we might be judged in certain situations, we don't ask for help. And when we observe things in other people, we're afraid to help because we might do the wrong thing. So it just carries on. So I think it's, you know, it's almost like a, an icebreaker that you're busting that open now. And I think the challenge is now to us in terms of you being a role model is that we talk to each other in that way and not always you know that you'd be redundant in five years no one wants to come in here uh you know a sports star talking about mental health sure that's the most normal thing in the world so i think that'd be brilliant if we could get there so it's great that everybody's here and participate so well done i look appreciate it and uh, very kind words and look nail on the head i think it's uh i think you know maybe me coming in here you know with my background and i've been open and honest but the, the challenge is what happens next um and I think what's really like I've been into companies and I, you know, I've spoken about mental health and yes, look, you, you get that positive feedback, but I've always kind of questioned people like, well, what are you going to do next? Like if we want an environment or a culture where we can trust people and we can be open and honest, how is that going to actually work? And, you know, some organizations are really good in peer to peer. And I think that's very, very important. There's one thing me coming in here, but, you know, in your own organization, someone that you can relate to, someone that you see on a daily basis, someone that maybe is at a, an executive level that you kind of look at them and you think, oh, they have it sorted. You know, that's their gold medals. The most powerful thing is when you have a peer that actually goes, you know what, I don't have a sort of here is the reality of what's going on. And that can be really, really impactful. Um, and it takes time, you know, these sort of things. And, you know, I, I'm sure a testament to Brian and the work that your team is doing. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes an element of buy in. But again, we're all here because it's probably something that um, is important to us and we want that culture. So, you know, to drive that, it takes time. It takes kind of a lot of work. It takes people. It takes the ambassadors, almost the champions getting out there and maybe that structure um, and routine of events over a course of time that you build up that level of trust um, and people know then, you know, what? It's an, it's, it's an open space to be open and honest. And I think that's what we're all craving for. And that's all what we want. So um, I appreciate your kind words and, and thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, and well said. Uh, I'm a mental health first aiders, if I'm not mistaken, throughout ESB as well, including at executive director level, if I'm not mistaken, Geraldine. So great to see leaders leading by example uh, when it comes to mental health first aid. Thanks, Adrian. I think do you have a question down here? Yeah. How are you doing, David? Lee from Aon's Human Capital Solution Team. Um, again, likewise, appreciate the open honesty. And I think fighting that stigma is quite important. But listening, we're kind of listening to how you spoke, you kind of categorized your well-being into three main points, kind of financial, mental, and, and physical. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the, the importance of your self-evaluation. My question is, have you self-evaluated since Hell Week? And if so, was there any added benefit to it? 
Yeah, yeah, good question uh, and well observed. <laughs> you put them in the categories. Uh, yeah, I have. And see, Hell Week was just, it was so intense and it was harder than I'd watched all the previous series and things like that. But what really struck me was the um, the emotional side of it, you know, and, and the fact that I learned an awful lot about my own, uh, like how, I suppose, my awareness around myself, um, simple little things by maybe not like kind of backing myself, maybe not trusting myself, maybe even a little bit more of kind of fearful of being in, in, in groups and how I'd be judged and what I might say. So I'll say nothing because I don't want to sound like a fool, things like that. Um, and again, when you're thrown into an environment like that, you know, what the DSs are looking for is like, well, who's going to be the loud voice? Who's going to be the person that's essentially the, the alpha, you know? Um, and for me, I, I would struggle in that environment. And that was something where, you know, I came away from um, from Helby questioning, what, why do I act like that? Why do I feel like that? You know, what's the driver behind that? Because, you know, that's probably one of the things that's maybe stopped me trying new things, um, maybe asking questions, maybe reaching out, but like in particular taking that step. And, you know, I thought about my own career where there was times that maybe I didn't back myself. You know, I didn't trust my own gut feeling. I was maybe waiting for other people to lead and I just slot in behind. And the interesting thing about uh, Hell Week, they'd spot that and they'd come down on you. You know, they used to call you, oh, who's the grey man? Who's the grey man? Who's hiding? Um, and I, I actually quite liked that because, you know, the evaluation and even going back, like when I came away from Hell Week, I had to ring Ray Goggins and raise the, the, the lead DS like, um, and I needed that debrief. I almost needed to kind of understand like what, what did he see in me and even the psychologist, because when you finish the show, they don't just let you go home. You have to have a medical and you have to um, have a, a talk with the psychologist. Um, and even that evaluation, you know, you'd go through that. And it, w it was really eye opening in terms of like my own evaluation, but even my own self-awareness and where I was at. And, you know, what actually happened was I scored myself really low and everyone else scored me really high. And I was thinking, well, something's not right here. Why, why am I scoring myself low? Um, and again, I think it's maybe it's self-belief, it's confidence. Um, maybe it's always looking for other people's approval. Um, and, and that was definitely something that I've, I've kind of tried to work on with my own psychologist now and kind of even doing a little bit of CBT and trying to understand what's driving that. Is it that internal dialogue um, or is it, you know, just like socially where I see myself? And that's definitely something that, um, yeah, it's it, it's work in progress. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no, I will not be back as a DS um, there. Uh, do you know the amazing thing is like, I would have always thought, no way could I do that. No way could anyone do that. The amount of work and the lack of sleep and food and you've been challenged and all the kind of the, the physical exertion. Um, but it's actually quite amazing that I kind of thought like, I'm probably only living at 40% of my capabilities. You know, I'm, I'm probably, there's a whole lot more I, I'm able for. Uh, and that's something that struck me with the DS is like, they just, they're, they're, they're different. They're different people and all their training and everything that go through makes them that. And, you know, I, I've like, I've so much respect for the Irish military um, and what they do. And uh, one of the, the proudest things was coming out on the final task and you had two helicopters from the Air Corps and um, like pilots, wingmen, all that. And the sense of pride I got by going off and, um, jumping out of a helicopter on like by Bear Island on like what maybe 5 a.m. on on a Saturday morning and then getting picked up, you know, waiting for these to it was unbelievable. It was a stuff you just like as a little kid, you know, when you're playing like you know army and you're pretending you jump off the sofa as if it's a helicopter. I actually did that and um, I was so present. And I remember like Billy Holland, people might know Billy from playing rugby. Um, you had Satanto Halpine and Eric Donovan. The two of them were, were asleep. They were they were just conked out, whereas me and Billy were like, this is amazing. Um, and we, we both commented on the fact that we were so present. We weren't scrambling around looking for the phone to take a selfie, you know, as we were flying over back into Cork. Um, it was just one of these moments where you're just so, so present. And, and I can remember at the end of Hell Week when we were all like, right, to go home. Nobody wanted to turn on their phone, you know, because of all that. We were just so in the moment. Uh, it was brilliant. 
and that's something that I'll, I'll, I'll definitely cherish. But no, no way would I ever do it again. The <laughs> show is actually, would you believe, there's no more. Hell, Hell Week is done, and um, Dancing with the Stars is no I was, more. Either. I was going to say, yeah, there's no option for next no, year. I'm out Dancing the with the Stars. No, no, I'll have to think of something different. We have a question here, do we? And the fi- Maybe a final question, because I want to leave some time for people to chat afterwards as well. Uh, Hi, Brian um, and David. So thanks for sharing. And when no, you said, ma- no marathon questions. No, 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 we're not trying to talk about it. We already swapped stories there. Um, it's a great leveler, though, when you can talk to a, a, an Olympian and a world champion. And you're actually kind of on the same level when it comes to marathon running. But um, <laughs> no, look, thanks for sharing. And, and you said something about recognizing you, I think, when you spoke to Richard Sadlier. And I can certainly recognize me in when you had your eureka moments uh, with your wife. I had something similar. So I had a change of career recently. Um, I'm now head of Healthy Ireland in the Department of Health. I had 19 years in another public sector organization. I'm really passionate about workplace well-being, as you might imagine, because I'm here. But I really struggled in the new environment. I really did. And um, I I just kept going because that's what you do. And I came down one evening after working a long day. And I said to Alexa, play Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles because I wanted to hear something upbeat. And Alexa didn't work. And my wife's like, oh, yeah, I tried to link my phone to Alexa. It's not working. And I lost the Heather. I actually, the hell are you doing? Nah, 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 nah. And I had that little moment where I went, OK, we need to do something about this. So I guess just in the spirit of Sharon, I went, got some help, talked to somebody, figured all that out. But one of the people on my team actually said to me, and I think this is really important for us as leaders within an organization, show a bit of vulnerability. She spotted something in me and she kind of said, look, I I don't think, I I think you're carrying too much around. She said, you're very kind to me, but you're not kind to yourself. So I think an important message for us as leaders is is self-care. You need to be able to look after yourself first. And I just wonder, David, in terms of your interaction with the corporate side, senior leaders, particularly men, in my experience, it's all about the uh, heroic leader and carrying the organization on your shoulder. Are you seeing any shift in that in, in some of your interactions with uh, with the with the corporates that you work with? Yeah, like, and I appreciate your honesty um, and sharing your story. And it is something that um, I have seen. I'm going to be brutally honest, right? I've seen a lot of organizations tick a box um, and kind of maybe jump on like, you know, mental health day or week. And I've been at places where you will get no um, executive level come to it. Um, and I've also been at places when they would come, but there's no interest. And that's the honest. The, the head's in the phone. They're elsewhere. They're not, they're not present, really. You know, it's, they almost might feel that they're shown support by just being there. Um, whereas people notice that and people see that. Um, have I seen a change? Yeah, I, I, in some circumstances, I've seen a change. Um, I've seen people would come along and maybe interact. And then the aftermath, I might get a comment saying, God, like, you know, they've never come to anything. And this could have been like an executive. Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's huge. And it goes back to what I mentioned about the peer to peer. Like, it's so important that, you know, leaders um, show, not, not necessarily show the vulnerability, but show that support in a meaningful way, like interact, you know, maybe it is getting up and saying a few words. Maybe it is actually, you know, putting the phone in the pocket and actually engaging in a conversation. Um, I think that's vitally, vitally important. And I think there is change. Definitely, Tom, definitely. I've seen elements of it, but we still have a long way to go. And it, this is something that, you know, we're always going to be working on mental health and physical well-being and promoting that. Of course we are. It's it's just the way it's going to be. But I, I think, um, you know, we can never stop. Uh, and again, if you are a leader, it is it is shown that element of vulnerability, perhaps, or even just that support and being vocal about it. And, you know, if there's initiatives taking place or events, you know, go to them and, and interact. It could be an hour, it could be 30 minutes, but that might have a massive impact on someone who's, who is struggling and maybe give them the confidence to get to, to, to open up and share and be honest. So, you know, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think there is a change. I think there's an appetite for change. Um, I think people want to do it. Um, we just have to make sure that it's not just tokenism either. You know, I think it has to be meaningful and it has to be uh, robust and it has to be consistent as well. Brilliant. Great question, Tom, and thanks for sharing. 
I think we're, we'll, we'll, we'll give everyone a little bit of time to have a chat afterwards. We're not running out the door, but final, final question, David. Look, where we see you in 2023, uh, what are the plans? So dancing on the stars, dancing on ice, not happening, but uh, where will we see you? No, no. Um, no, continue. I obviously do a lot um, in kind of workplace well-being um, with various companies. And, uh, you know, it, my, my kind of job now is very, it's broad. It does an element of variety. I do a lot of TV work as well. So covering a lot of sport um, and this year will be no different. So, uh, yeah, you never know where you'll see me. But um, no, look, it's uh, it's good. It's fun. And um, yeah, it, it's challenging at the same time as well. So, again, just thank you uh, for having me along this evening. And I really appreciate everyone coming along. I know people are busy and you probably uh, have a lot going on in your life. So to come and actually just um, chill out and have a bit of a chat. Um, it's, it's really pleasing and it shows that there is, like I said, that applied for change. So, you know, I, I appreciate that. So thank you. Well, listen, we really, really appreciate you. Appreciate you. And I think I speak for everyone by saying that was an absolutely class session. So thanks for sharing so much with us today, David. Thank you. And um, I'll, I'll be hanging around here for a little bit as well. If anyone wants to ask me anything individual, uh, please don't be shy. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks so much, David. Be the same myself. And um, listen, a huge thanks to Geraldine, to Brian, to Danielle, and all the team at ESB who put a huge effort into hosting us today and facilitating us in this lovely, lovely space. Really appreciate that. So thanks so much, uh, everybody. Um, thanks, Annalise, for the photos. Connor Sweeney has uh, got uh, some vegan ice cream out there. Check that out. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, the audience, for coming. We're going again. I think we're probably going to be in HubSpot. You know, I didn't even put the tags up. You can, you can, you can share a few tags now there on Instagram. Um, we're going to be in probably HubSpot in March. So you'll see, if you're on the mailing list, which you all will be, you will see that coming soon, the details for that. And look, I, sh I know I, I didn't iron the shirt, but look, um, if anyone has a question for me afterwards, you don't want to ask it here, just send me a note. I'll be more than happy to uh, to answer that. So listen, thanks. I don't know if you want to say a few words, Charlie. No, we're good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.